uh, all the previous uh, chairmen that have uh, expressed profound gratitude uh, to Jerry and his wonderful team. Uh, first of all, for uh, inviting WIPO to participate uh, in this truly impressive uh, event, uh, especially knowing sometimes some of the strong feelings that uh, Jerry has about <laughs> WIPO. But uh, we've been extremely impressed by uh, the quality of, uh, of all of you guys, and it's been a real privilege and uh, honor for us uh, to be invited. So um, without further ado, I think we should... Uh, kick off uh, into this very, as Jerry said yesterday, uh, interesting and controversial uh, topic. And the first uh, speaker is uh, Thomas uh, Cotier. Uh, Dr. Cotier is uh, professor of law and also managing uh, director of the uh, World Trade Institute uh, in Bern, uh, Switzerland. So I have the pleasure to give you the floor, uh, Professor Cotier. Thank you very much. I, I guess it's not, it's not an accident that this topic is uh, dealt with on a Sunday morning. Uh, a lot of people consider this to be um, somewhat idealistic, perhaps even backward looking and not something for the day to day uh, work uh, during the week. Um, I'll, I'll try to make the point to the contrary and actually get you back to a work day. Um, and I'm going to address uh, traditional knowledge in relation to plant genetic resources. This is only one aspect of it, but I think it's the most important one as it really affects millions of people around the world in their everyday life. Now, what are the issues here? The issues are that traditional knowledge is very important for the conservation use of uh, plant genetic resources for food and agriculture. It's through uh, th this knowledge that uh, the variety and the bio variety is being uh, maintained and used here. It has become ex of importance, increased, enhanced importance in relation to genetical engineering. And we have seen appropriations through uh, the IP system being applied uh, in the process of bioprospecting. But it leaves farmers without any economic reward, and at the same time, it is relevant to biodiversity and sustainable development here. The question is, should it remain in the public domain? Should it remain a public good, or should it uh, become a matter for property allocation? Now, briefly, just to uh, recall the notion of traditional knowledge here, uh, it's important to say that this is, this is collective knowledge. This is not individual knowledge, as we know in copyright or even in patent law, it's, it's usually a community here. And uh, here you can see um, the elements. Uh, it's helped by a farming community. It's often helped by indigenous peoples and minority cultures, but not only. In, in many, many developing countries, uh, traditional knowledge is a main factor in daily life. And I think it's a wrong perception to limit the whole problem to indigenous people and actually uh, isolated into a minority issue here. I think it affects a large majority of people here. Um, it is information which remains in the informal sector. Agriculture, uh, traditional agriculture is organized in informal ways. <coughs> it's not part of the formal system. And it comprises information as well as skill and practice, but not, does not extend to the product as such. So what comes out of applying traditional knowledge is not really captured under that notion as I would understand it here. Now under the current um, doctrine of permanent sovereignty of natural resources, which has replaced uh, the uh, common heritage doctrine in, in, in food and, uh, and these resources, basically we have two approaches of which governments can choose. They can actually leave it as a public good, and here you can see uh, all the uh, attributes to this, uh, res nullius, free flow, um, but you then need the public policies to support it. It takes the taxpayer to fund the projects, fund the programs. On the other hand, you may have a, a proprietary approach where basically, uh, to the extent possible, you have allocation and assignment and you may enter into uh, a sui, sui generis type of intellectual property right with exclusive rights, with licensing possibilities, contractual and compensation. 
this is basically the two, the two extreme basic models of <coughs> which countries can choose under permanent sovereignty over natural resources here. What we see in starting to look at this is an increasing gap. We have, uh, and we heard this uh, over the last two days, uh, broad legal protection of genetically engineered products, uh, the patents, the plant variety protection, it's expanding. If we look at patenting genes, um, it's ever expanding in, in, in scope. At the same time, we essentially, uh, unless there is legislation to the contrary, we have full and free use of traditional knowledge in relation to resources for genetical engineering in these areas which are listed here. You can actually uh, help yourself and use these resources because traditional knowledge has been in the public domain. Now, how do we, how do we um, go about this? Let's look first at the balance of interest as we find it within intellectual property in WTO law. I think that was addressed yesterday. The basic deal was uh, improved access um, to markets in agriculture, which should become gradual. The second one was better access in textiles. And the third one was perhaps a promise to enhanced uh, transfer of technology, foreign direct investment, and also uh, developing country innovations. Perhaps the most important element is not mentioned here. It's just containment of the big powers, um, the United States and the European community, in pushing the agenda further. You can say, this is what we committed to. We're not going to take it further. Um, it has worked to some extent, not extensively here. But um, the TRIPS agreement in itself, and Fred Abbott said this very early on, this is about protecting first world assets. It's not, it's not protecting um, <coughs> rights in a balanced way between industrialized and developing countries. That was clear from the outset. The question is whether that imbalance, uh, given the fact that the two first ones, market access in agriculture and textiles, are only slowly moving, can be improved within the TRIPS agreement itself whether we can bring about a better balance here. Now, my, I'm optimistic here because there, this is what I really believe is the basic common ground for a trade-off here. We will need, over the next 10, 20 years, improved patent protection, plant varieties, and for genetic, uh, genetically modified organisms. And that protection will have to take place in developing countries because developing countries are the main users of GMOs. It will not be the Europeans, and it will, may not be the US, it will be uh, the developing part of the world which needs um, additional food. If you go into the food statistics and you see the increase of food requirement over the next 20 years, this is fairly apparent. And the TRIPS agreement doesn't, com doesn't provide sufficient protection uh, when you look at Article 27 these days. There is a shared interest around the world of preserving plant genetic resources, of which 95% is in the developing world here. The Green Revolution and the former revolutions in, in the northern countries have eliminated the varieties to a large extent, and the potential, the capital, is in developing countries. And we share a common interest to preserve them here. And I think from a point of view of a of a Western country, uh, there is a genuine interest to enhance the legitimacy of the IPR system. In particular, countries who depend on export of technologies have such an interest, and that's what they should take into account into looking into this year. Now, how were, how, what were the approaches so far? I think, generally speaking, we can say that there were public policy um, approaches who limited the use of intellectual property to a large extent. The CBD, you know it very well recognize implicitly tradition knowledge, but is alien to IPRs. It provides contract-based remunerations, access legislation, benefit sharing, access to technology for donors, um, multilateral funding, which hasn't come forward so far. It's a public domain policy to bring about the um, goals of conservation and use. I think the same is uh, what we can find in the CGIR. Maybe Susan can... can um, a comment later on that here. It's been clearly a public domain policy with public financing. Um, the seed banks, um, conservation through use policies, uh, agricultural research, 
although they increasingly face the problem that the public funds are decreasing and the private research has been increased, and so they are faced with, uh, with uh, dealing with IPRs as well. Um, there are limitations of taking out IPRs. We have the material transfer agreements, and we talked guest yesterday already um, about the um, international treaty and the IPR-based contributions. That's a first inroad of recognizing, actually, uh, IPRs in the system here, and it was a real hard battle uh, to actually um, realize this. In different countries, national access legislations have developed. Um, there's no uniformity here. We have very different forms here. Now, there are about 22 countries um, who work around in different forms, perhaps with India the leading legislation on uh, combining plant variety protection with benefit sharing a prior informed consent and the creation of sui generis rights in, in different forms here. The point is that this, as the system is today, it has no impact whatsoever in the north. Whatever you legislate and access, um, you can't enforce any of these rights in the major markets. This is where we stand. Uh, Unfortunately, it's not very readable. Um, just to, to demonstrate uh, the variety of international organizations who have been dealing with these issues here. Um, we have standards, we have uh, model rules, we have databases, and you can see that um, uh, a great variety of institutions are addressing uh, these issues, uh, and we have the corresponding cacophony um, on, on the matter here. I mean, in the paper you find uh, a detailed uh, record of what was d what uh, in different uh, institutions uh, happened here. So there certainly is a need for an international system here. I believe this is not something we can leave to bottom up as we had it in the um, uh, IPs over 200 years. It's something which has to be um, con um, coordinated from, from, from the top. There is a danger of fragmentation between local and versus international divide. Uh, there is also a, a, a risk of, of fragmentation and divide between the different international organizations who are dealing uh, with these, uh, these problems here. And the goal is actually how to achieve the northern market, how to establish the disciplines which will have an effect uh, here. That's the ultimate goal, and that can only be done through international law. Now, before I go into the IPR aspect, I want to make it very clear that the IPR aspect is just a small fragment of an overall strategy. This is not something exclusive and the hopes that we can save uh, the world, etc., through creating a new IPR, uh, of course, is uh, ridiculous. It's one element, but I just give you, give you uh, the flanking policies which are needed uh, and which are also part of a project we're doing. Uh, it's essentially a part of agricultural policies, and, and if you want to foster the products coming out of the use of traditional knowledge, you will need labeling, you will need favorable SPS measures, you will need uh, subsidies and tax incentives, and you may need to go into differential tariff structures in reducing tariffs and in, in favoring TK-based uh, products here. You will need, on the other hand, in a public domain, the conservation policies. It's Certainly not that trade regulation can replace funding on a large extent, uh, uh, efforts to sustain um, uh, biodiversity. Okay, now let's turn briefly to um, the question whether we could protect uh, traditional knowledge uh, in IPR laws here. And I think there is a fundamental challenge. We have to restore the equities, uh, which um, the inequities uh, which, which resulted from having extensive protection on the one hand in genetical engineering and having no protection and public good uh, domains on the other hand here. That's the challenge here. And these are the questions. How can we link the IPRs to benefit sharing? How to balance appropriations with pre-existing investment found in the public domain? Um, how to bring out the already addressed defragmentation of the international system here? Now, there are a, a number of objections. This is really an uphill uh, walk, an uphill battle uh, on two fronts. First of all, you have a lot of objections within the IPR community itself. They say, 
IPRs is about innovation, it's about novelty. How can you address traditional knowledge by way of that instrument? This is, this is, a, this is a, a contradiction. You shouldn't do that. Well, first of all, uh, if you look at um, intellectual property, we don't have the novelty element in all the forms. We have trademarks, uh, trade secrets. Uh, we have novelty in parts of the form, but not across the board. Um, it is said TK cannot be identified here. First of all, um, there is research going on in the International Plant Genetic Resources Institute to see to what extent the, um, the origin of plant genetic resources can be identified. And uh, the, there, these studies have not been completed, but there are indications that, for example, in the field of health plants, there is a high level of identification possible and also in, in plant genetics, um, plant genetic resources uh, to, to some extent. But here, um, I'd like to mention that IPRs can also be vested into a community. It has not, it doesn't have to be a uh, particular person. Um, I think they say TK is primarily a process. Uh, well, we also have process patents. That's nothing particularly new. And, well, they say TK is very holistic. Um, I would answer, well, we're looking into commercial uses. We're looking at the interface with the modern industry, with the modern, modern world. We're not going beyond that here. And then there, of course, are the public good objections here, which um, are um, brought in from the other side, that this would endanger an open system. Um, I think here the answer is, well, under permanent sovereignty of natural resources, countries may have the right to, uh, to restrict to some extent here. There are clashes with the CBD convention. Um, they don't like IPRs. I think they addressed IPRs as they exist. They didn't address new type forms of IPRs and disliking them at this stage here. Uh, it encroaches up in plant breeders' exemptions, and that is correct. If you have uh, additional rights, the plant breeder will have to take into account uh, such rights and may not be free as they are today here. But the paper proposes uh, the creation of what I call tip rights, is traditional intellectual property rights here. And um, essentially, um, these are new rights uh, of appropriation by communities. They would entail exclusive marketing rights and selling, and they are essentially allocating private property rights to the extent that the resources can be sufficiently located here. They're different from collective rights, natural resource rights, farmers' rights, etc. They would be subject to a global registration facility. Um, I'm not going into the details for this um, as time is running here, but they would be modeled in effect uh, in the same way as uh, in terms of registration also uh, legal, pr legal protection in terms of opposition or judicial um, review, um, they would be, they would be um, orchestrated in a similar way as traditional normal IPRs as we knew them here. Uh, there would be licensing, the sale of rights or exclusive rights. There might be just compensation. The essential point at this stage is here is really to think hard, and I'd like to have your comments on that, is is what the purpose of these rights should be. And I think here you can see that um, it would be wrong, and I think uh, you mentioned that yesterday, uh, the public good is not to be uh, opposed uh, to private rights or IPRs. IPRs may also serve the public good. And to the extent here that uh, such new rights may empower communities vis-a-vis uh, industries vis-a-vis -vis the government, uh, the cause for the public good is being enforced and, and reinforced here. So the socio-economic function, the socio-ecological uh, functions, are, 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 are very at the very heart of actually uh, seeking to define these these rights here. Now, just briefly, um, uh, the 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 essential uh, criteria, uh, the notion which could define these rights here. It's important, it's limited to commercially uh, viable information. It's, it's, it's interfacing um, these activities with 
um, industrial production, industrial work. It's an inter interlinkage. Um, I don't. You can read the the the, the elements here uh, on your own, which would contribute to the composition of, of that notion here. The right holders again would be um, communities, collective ownership. Um, you may even have uh, multiple ownership. You may have ownership of communities uh, not geographically uh, con um, contained. Uh, you may have um, rights in a particular rice uh, in one country and in another country as well. I don't think that would be excluded here. <coughs> this should be distinguished from uh, the use of traditional normal IPRs as we knew them in, in the rural uh, development as well. So new developments uh, uh, pet, w could use petty patents, grassroots innovation, copyright, etc. Um, so it would be complementary. The scope of rights basically here is uh, preventing third parties. Um, and the question is, how far should these rights expand? And this is a point where maybe you will come in. Um, should there be exclusive rights or should they be limited to compensation? This is perhaps a case where liability is more appropriate because we're, we're doing the reverse here. It's also important to say that you don't have to use these rights, for example, vis-a-vis -vis others. You can always um, leave them aside. Um, so um, within rural communities, traditions can continue as they were here. The duration here, quickly, um, it's the reverse actually from, um, from um, normal IPRs as we are moving from the public domain into a private realm and that creates uh, uh, particular, particular questions we need to discuss here. Um, I, would, I would actually suggest that we, based on the materials we discussed, so that you would actually be eligible for, for such rights if you have looked after plant genetic resource for at least uh, 50 years. I wouldn't go much further. Uh, because then the identification would be, become very, very difficult here. Um, I would say that there should be no duration of the right, but if, you, you, if it is used in relation to a specific project, you would actually uh, be able to obtain license fees for about 10 years here. Just uh, to, to conclude, this is the relationship to other IPRs. Uh, of course, plant variety protection patents uh, will have to be linked up, contract law, uh, geographical indications are very important to support the products which may come out of traditional knowledge here, uh, but it cannot replace traditional knowledge protection as such. It has a complementary function here. And then the WTO, um, yes, I think there has to be um, a preparation for a major negotiation within Article 27. Uh, recall the basic uh, interests. There has to be an expansion of the patent rules. But at the same time, we may introduce uh, the protection of uh, traditional knowledge in order to uh, achieve an overall equity here. We will need the flanking policies, TRIPS. This question cannot be negotiated in isolation. It has to be done in coordination with agricultural policies, uh, with gradual liberalization. And we need to shift agricultural policy liberalization in a direction that it really benefits uh, developing countries and not only uh, the large crop producers here. And, and you need to bring about coordination uh, among all these uh, players in that particular field. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Thomas, for being really on time and for an excellent uh, presentation. Uh, now we'll listen to uh, Graham Duffield, uh, the Herschel Smith uh, Senior Research Fellow, Queen Mary uh, Intellectual Property Research Institute, uh, University of London. And he's going to talk on the legal and economic aspects of uh, TK. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, well, first I'd like to thank um, uh, Joe and Keith for inviting me to the conference. It's a great honor to be here, and I've really enjoyed it so far. Uh, unlike um, Thomas, I'm going to talk about traditional knowledge in the area of health rather than agriculture. Now, perhaps it would be more correct uh, for me to, me to call this um, economic, legal, uh, and practical 
um, aspects of TK protection uh, as uh, for reasons that will become clear uh, as I go through my presentation. Now, um, okay, so let's start with economics. This is, is really the short part of my presentation because uh, so few um, studies have been conducted on the value of uh, health-related traditional knowledge. I'll give you one figure um, back to 1990. Estimate of the sales value of plant-derived pharmaceuticals sold in OECD countries was in that year was $61 billion. This isn't a figure for traditional knowledge, but um, Norman Farnsworth, University of Illinois, uh, has counted 119 plant-based compounds um, used in the pharmaceutical industry, of which 74% have the same or similar uses as the medicinal plants from which they were derived. So it gives you some indication that um, uh, industry over the years has certainly derived a great deal of benefit uh, from uh, using from access to traditional knowledge relating to health uh, and the plants with which the knowledge is associated. But the future potential can only be guessed at. Of course, this is a problem in terms of sol solving the problem uh, of protecting traditional knowledge. If you don't really know how much it's worth, uh, how far do we want to commit ourselves to legal protection? I should point out, though, that TK, as I call it for short, is not just a raw material for industry because 80% of people in developing countries do depend on traditional medicine for their healthcare needs. Why? It's cheaper and it's often effective for certain illnesses, illnesses that commonly afflict, afflict people in those countries. Now, where's the problem here? The problem is that this knowledge is disappearing very, very fast. Yet industry has always got a free ride. And if you've always been getting a free ride, why should you have to pay for it? Um, as, uh, uh, this, this is a discussion I had on uh, Friday with uh, um, Peter Gerhardt. Uh, uh, I should uh, mention that because uh, that's what he said. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, now, the problem here is that there is no trust, because that may have been okay in the past, but these indigenous groups are becoming aware that there is money being made out of this, out of their knowledge, and they're getting nothing in return. If there's no, dis no trust, why should they disclose their knowledge? Now, the fact that this knowledge is disappearing isn't necessarily due to some kind of um, coercion. It's often the case that these groups do want to change. Um, but they want to change on their own terms. Often they aren't allowed to do that. But on their own terms means, among other things, um, uh, maintaining many of their customary ways of doing things, which includes their own laws and regulations governing access and use of their knowledge something governments don't want to concede. Um, I'll give you a little, a little story. I worked for an, um, uh, in Geneva for an agency of the UN, not WIPO, I would hasten to add, um, in which I, 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 I co-authored the background paper of a, of, a, of a conference on traditional knowledge. And I was told by my boss to strike out reference to customary law because the governments will not take it. They will not accept that. So uh, that, that had to go. Um, so that's something uh, governments, including those ones that are very much uh, um, in the forefront of negotiations on the subject in Geneva, do not really want to discuss. Although sometimes they mention it, but don't want to do anything about it. <laughs> now, um, I'll just give you a, a little summary of some of the um, legal um, solutions being um, considered. Unfortunately, this transparency is a bit curly, um, so I'll, I'll have to hold it down, I'm afraid. Uh, <laughs> now, um, you notice number six is actually uh, is TIP, which is uh, Thomas's proposal to show how up to date I can be. I've added it to my transparency. Unfortunately, <laughs> I have a blue pen, so it's a little bit illegible. <laughs> now, um, oh, sorry, it's, uh, it's not very straight, is it? Um, okay. Um, so these are is a summary of some of the proposals that I've uh, that I know of. Now, one could uh, separate these measures into defensive and positive. Defensive uh, means stopping um, unauthorized use and appropriation. 
Um, positive means actually a system that is um, directed at TK protection, allowing them to um, uh, uh, um, the usual kind of IP exclusionary rights, um, freedom to operate, uh, freedom to prevent others from, uh, from, from using. So it's quite different, although they're not actually mutually exclusive, I, I should mention. Um, okay, so I should point out actually, uh, give, give, give due credit, uh, some of the people who are here today have been responsible for proposing some of these. Um, um, uh, if you read the paper, you'll find out um, which uh, uh, individuals uh, have been responsible. Now, of these, the ones that are being um, discussed and the most um, in Geneva uh, are one and two on the left. And I'll, uh, I'll let's talk a bit about those. Okay. Now, I'll show you this transparency here. It's just about to uh, show. Okay. There was, um, just to give you an idea of where the um, demand is, the, the demanding governments, um, where, their, where their particular um, demands are, are, are focused. Well, this is um, uh, a communique that came out of a seminar that took place in Delhi um, with uh, on the involvement of, of UNCTAD, uh, which may or may not be the, uh, the UN agency that I, uh, I saw alluded to earlier. Um, now... Uh, just to just give you an idea of the sort of, of where, where they're at. Now, 14 governments were involved in developing this communique, uh, which India was one, um, um, Cuba, um, uh, Kenya, I think, well, from Africa, from Latin America, uh, uh, and, and some Asian countries. So, okay, they did mention customary laws there. Uh, so they do mention it. Uh, they do pay, um, sorry, that sounds terribly cynical. They do pay the, a lip service to this, but... Uh, a little bit reluctant to do anything about it. Um, two, protection of uh, knowledge, the registers of TK, in order to avoid misappropriation. And three, um, I'll just draw your attention to number three, a procedure whereby the use of TK from one country is allowed, particularly for seeking IPR protection or commercialization, only after the competent national authority of the country of origin gives a certificate that source of origin is disclosed and prior informed consent including acceptance of benefit sharing conditions uh, obtained. Well, pro-informed consent. Uh, implicitly, the, the pro-informed consent of the competent authority, and not necessarily the providers of traditional knowledge. But I'll say a little more about pro-informed consent um, soon. I shall just, uh, that's my last transparency, so I'll, oh, can you add? Okay, there we are. Okay, so, let me say a few things then about the databases and also about disclosure and prior informed consent. First, on databases. Before going further, I want to just say that there is a divide between some governments like uh, and that of India uh, and a few African governments on the one hand and Latin America on the other. It's very important to understand this. Um, generally, uh, if you read uh, what comes out, out of India, there's a perception that traditional knowledge either belongs to India, or belongs uh, to nobody, depending on the rhetoric um, employed. It can be a bit, a bit confusing. But in Latin America, sorry, it, it, it's true. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> now, in Latin America, it's a little bit different because um, through historical experience and through perhaps a little bit of, of guilt on the part of governments, they do generally uh, accept that this knowledge does originate in or come from uh, certain populations, indigenous groups. So that is a difference. And, and, and this difference um, uh, often becomes apparent in the proposals that are put forward at, at WIPO and other, other, other forums. Okay. Now, India in particular has been um, uh, investing in developing um, a database of classical uh, texts, texts uh, of, of, of traditional medicine. Uh, the, uh, the Ayurvedic um, system uh, uh, being uh, the main one of recording uh, knowledge uh, and making it available as prior art. Now, I suspect, I have a bad feeling that the idea of, of documenting this knowledge and putting it on a, on a, on a CD or a collection of CD-ROMs and sending these to patent offices may actually disappoint um, those who actually are promoting this. 
Uh, why? I, I can think of two reasons. One reason that in some jurisdictions, the blindingly obvious is patentable. Um, you don't need a prior art a database to know, for example, that US patent 6329919 on system and method for providing reservations for restroom use describes the obvious. As is patent number 6257248 for both hand hair cutting method. Or a recent Japanese patent they told me would never be granted, but was for cooking of curry with curry powder. Um, two, um, India, um, or some people in India, seem to believe that such a database will block the patenting of biochemical discoveries based on research on medicinal plants. Now, it's possible this database will may perhaps um, lead to claims being narrowed, perhaps. But uh, the fact that uh, it's well established you can patent chemicals isolated, purified from medicinal plants um, means that just describing uh, uh, um, um, a traditional use of, 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 of this plant will not be sufficient to invalidate um, a, a patent or lead to a, a patent not being granted in the first place. Also, there's a division between India and some other countries in the sense that India wants this database to be made completely uh, public and not just to patent examiners, where some other, other countries would like to still um, keep it kind of, keep confidential to some extent because they're worried that you're simply presenting information uh, to industry in a way that would be very useful for them. Um, okay, that's um, some of my sort of concerns about uh, databases of traditional knowledge. Um, what about disclosure of origin and prior informed consent? Now, I've been talking about prior informed consent for years and years without really knowing what it actually means um, <coughs> in practice. Um, well, I guess this is what one does sometimes. Um, <laughs> so what I'd like to do is to briefly, um, I'll be brief, um, des describe a case that shows how important it is to be very real and practical and to go beyond a model mongering, important and necessary as that is. That you do need to experiment and you need to get things wrong in order to get things right. Uh, and also important to show that practice really is more important than uh, um, theory. I'm going to talk about a bioprospecting project in Peru that was funded by the NIH, this country, and began in 1993. Now, this involved a number of institutions, um, a, a, a university with the word Washington in it, of which there are three in this country, I believe, but this is the one in St. Louis, um, two Peruvian educational institutions, um, GD Searle, which uh, was at the time um, uh, a part of Monsanto, and um, quote, unquote, the Aguaruna people. Um, now, um, I'm... <sighs> I have to give credit to um, uh, a, student a student in Chicago called Shane Green, uh, who wrote a very nice unpublished report about this, uh, this project. But he, he, he discovered through his own, uh, his own, his own field work that there are 240 uh, communities of the Agaruna people, at least 11 um, organizations that represent the interests of various Agaruna communities. And there are also um, uh, two inter-ethnic um, federations of indigenous people, of which uh, some of these organizations are, uh, are part of or affiliated to. Now, the initial deal was um, that there would be a collecting and screening of plants. And the Agaruna people, whoever they are, would receive collection fees plus royalties. The question that immediately rose of, well, who do we talk to? Um, whose pro-informed consent do we get? So, um, the university, um, and Washington University then first contacted an organization called uh, OCAAM, let's call them OCAM for short. Uh, it's not important to know what it stands for. Uh, now, this organization of agronomic communities was interested. Yes, we want to get involved in this. But the NIH got a bit nervous because they hadn't heard of them before and said, well, why don't you talk to this other group called the CAH, which, which is the Agaruna Wambisa Council? Talk to them instead because they're, they're much, much better known and they're bigger. So 
there was a deal a year later involving this other organization, the CAH, and Washington University, acting as intermediary with Searle. Well, the CAH became rather suspicious because um, um, they didn't know about the deal between Searle and the university and thought, well, maybe they're, um, they're I'm colluding and uh, we're going to get ripped off. So uh, they managed to uh, contact an organization called RAFI, as they were called then, who had uh, an, an office in Ottawa and an office also in North Carolina, uh, as it happens. Um, and they got hold of the contract somehow, and they made a big fuss about this, uh, as did um, um, an Irish chap called Brendan Tobin, who um, lives in Peru and works for uh, an NGO, uh, a, a law, actually environmental law NGO, who compared the agreements involving uh, Seoul and the university and the agreement involving the university and the Agaruna people and thought, okay, this is a, this is a real bad deal. Um, it looks like Seoul are going to get, uh, uh, are going to do very nicely and the Agaruna are going to get ripped off yet again. But he decided to stay involved rather than to just complain. So what happened was that three, um, the CH withdrew. They didn't like any of this. They said, we're not going to get involved anymore. Um, the other organization, the OCAAM, are you still with me with these uh, names? They said, yes, we're still in this. We like it. Let's go ahead. They managed to get uh, three other organizations, agro organizations, also uh, uh, to meet together. So you had these three agro organizations, this Federation of Indigenous People, and uh, Brendan Tobin from the SPDA, uh, named his organization. And also uh, somebody from Searle came to the jungle to uh, take part in this meeting. Well, what happened? They went, they all decided to meet again in St. Louis at the headquarters of Monsanto, and they cooked out a know-how license uh, agreement, which uh, allows those organizations and any Agaruna groups that decide to join those organizations afterwards, um, they uh, agree to share their know-how, uh, they retain the ownership of that know-how, um, they will get annual payments, collection fees, license fees, and milestone payments in case any, uh, anything looks, uh, looks interesting uh, and is going to get tested, go through clinical trials, etc. And there will be a fund uh, made available not just to those Agaruna people who signed the deal, but also to others who also want to get involved. Okay, now did this deal work? Well, um, in a way, no, because after um, uh, four years the deal expired, Monsanto uh, decided not to, uh, uh, not to renew, and that was it, really. Uh, also, it did create divisions because um, one of the organizations that was most involved uh, got very excited about this and said, we're all going to make a lot of money here. Um, just uh, just, you know, just uh, trust us, we'll make a lot of money, we'll get money out of this company. Um, they didn't get very much out of it. So there were problems of conflicts between those groups that felt I'm disappointed that they were misled into an agreement that didn't really, um, didn't really help them, uh, didn't really provide that much in the way of benefits. But there were benefits, there were scholarships, there were payments to field informants, and there were um, um, small loans that became available. So there were some benefits, but not quite what was expected. Well, the lessons of this are, um, well, don't expect too much, but also um, don't overestimate the commercial value of traditional knowledge. Um, this and my earlier um, um, uh, um, presentation also, I think, should be uh, used to, to argue that involving the people, you know, the indigenous people, who are meant to be the beneficiaries of any kind of um, any kind of uh, protection system, they really do need to be involved directly in the development of solutions to their problems. Um, but it's still difficult and things will not go according to plan. Second, there's no single model that will work in all situations for all indigenous groups. The, the cultural diversity is such that a single solution will not work. This doesn't mean that um, single solutions uh, uh, um, cannot be tried, but one shouldn't expect too much of them. In turn, this shows that it is very difficult to harmonize to harmonize um, uh, legal norms uh, at the international level. 
because of the fact that diversity is so great, and also because those people who are promoting these norms tend to be um, people like me who wear suits and ties and live in places like Geneva uh, and don't really have much contact with uh, the grassroots sort of level. Uh, also, it's important to be pragmatic, I think, as well. Um, this particular arrangement was a know-how license, something very conventional. So sometimes you can use existing, existing uh, um, um, legal instruments, um, but sometimes uh, you have to think of something totally um, original. Now, the final point, which I want to, uh, uh, I think I do have time, is just to ask the question of, does legal protection of traditional knowledge mean enclosing the intellectual commons? Uh, in other words, is this another way, uh, another a manifestation of uh, Jamie Boyle's new enclosure uh, 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 um, idea? Well, I would say one thing that is happening anyway, and business is doing it, business is aggressively um, enclosing, and so are governments. Governments are blocking access to resources, they're blocking access to information themselves. Um, but I've always thought that really what we ought to be thinking about is actually recognizing the rights that already exist rather than necessarily creating new ones. And if you go back to the indigenous people themselves and ask them what um, are your rights, of this knowledge, what rights do you want, what rights do you, do, you, do you have according to your own customary norms, then I think you can start to move towards a solution. But I really believe that it has to be done first at the national level. Uh, rather than the international level, which is so far removed. That particular point of view isn't very popular uh, in the circles that I, 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 I tend to operate in. But uh, I do believe that the, you start from the local to the national and then to the international and not the other way around. Um, okay, I think I'll leave it there. Um, so just to say that um, I do share concerns among some people that a legal system to protect traditional knowledge might lead to further enclosure of the commons. And I, but I, I do think that at the end of the day, um, we have to start off with the indigenous people themselves and ask them what they want, what are their concerns, and how do we, uh, 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 how do we um, um, ensure this knowledge remains in use, ensure that trust is built between um, the private sector, between them, and that has to be the, the, the primary thing is building trust, and that trust is lacking. So uh, rather than be too dogmatic about enclosing the, the commons, I would say do whatever is necessary to build the trust because we do need the knowledge. Um, it does provide solutions to health problems that save the lives of millions of people. So uh, I think preservation and protection is, it has to be the primary thing rather than concern that's too much of a concern about um, 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 enclosure. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Graham. Now we have uh, Tony Taubman, who is the acting director of the TK division in the World Intellectual Property Organization, and um, together with Shaquille Batia, uh, the dynamo of the IGC, the Intergovernmental uh, Committee of the yeah, WIPO, sure. on this whole question. Thank you very much. Uh, Jeffrey, my, uh, my dear friend and colleague, is a, is a extremely uh, generous and polite uh, person. Uh, Shaq Hill is, is a dynamo. I'm never a dynamo, least of all on Sunday morning, <laughs> and uh, won't even attempt to live up to that description. I'm sorry about that. Uh, okay. Um, in the, in the time available, I'd like just very briefly to draw attention to the process that Jeffrey has mentioned and uh, try to engage the interest and, and attention of those who are, are working on these issues at a, a deeper, more thoughtful level than is possible uh, at, in the, the international frenzy. Uh, I'm very conscious and I accept Professor Reichman's um, jurisdiction in relation to the 20-minute deadline. Uh, 
however, I will interpret that in multilateral terms, <laughs> which means that at any time while I'm speaking, I will solemnly pledge to conclude in 20 minutes from that time. Uh, and I can cite uh, abundant state practice to support that interpretation. Uh, in, in drawing attention to the, 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 the uh, jurisprudential strengths of the, the Reichman and uh, vision, uh, I'd like to mention also that uh, apart from being a punctuality fetishist, as we've all uh, learnt to our cost, he, uh, and a serial uh, model, uh, model monger himself, uh, he is a, a vicious wielder of Occam's razor when it comes to other people's models. And uh, I speak as, a, as a, um, uh, a victim of this because indeed my uh, initial idea was to present in, uh, international perspectives on this issue. Uh, and you'll see in the program before you, it's been reduced to an international perspective. Uh, and uh, I guess this is in the interest of time. Uh, that in, in the, a, a quota has been imposed on me of one international perspective only. I'll do my best uh, to restrict to that. And I'll ask Jeffrey if he could hold up cards indicating how many perspectives I'm working on at that time. <laughs> when we're down to one, I'll know that I've done my job and I've met my quota. Um, but there, actually, there is a serious point to that, uh, which is this one, in that well, what is the plurality or the pluralism that we had to bring to this issue? Uh, and we've heard in the pre previous two speakers uh, two uh, not competing but complementary uh, ways of looking at this issue. Uh, one, uh, and I'd quote from the paper, uh, Graham Dutfield's paper, uh, the, the uh, statement from the Four Directions Council, any attempt to devise uniform guidelines for the recognition and protection of ind Indigenous people's knowledge runs the risk of collapsing this rich jurisprudential, jurisprudential diversity into a single model that will not fit the values, conceptions or laws of any indigenous society. On the other hand, um, Thomas Cottier has rightly pointed to the danger of cacophony uh, in the uh, international processes and the need for coordination and clarity. Uh, and uh, what I'd like to do in the time that I will make available, I hope, uh, is to find one way, some way of bridging that, mm. uh, that gap. Uh, now, it's a byword in, in Australian uh, trade diplomacy that the function of a bridge is to be walked upon. Uh, and I think I would like to propose that uh, role for, for uh, the WIPO process in this regard. So feel free to walk upon us. Um, that said, uh, I do have to enter a disclaimer. Uh, the paper that I had promised to deliver last week uh, was in progress then, was in progress then. Uh, it is now in serious regress uh, because of the uh, great insights that I've acquired uh, by virtue of being here. And, and uh, uh, by the way, thanks warmly for the invitation to, to take part. Um, and as a result, I won't even make, make use of the, the um, presentations that have been circulated, the, the PowerPoint slides that have been circulated, but I'll compress my presentation to essentially, well, the role reversal that's been going on generally. I'm going to offer crypto commentary on the papers of others uh, in the form of a, a supposed nominal paper. Um, and uh, it's, it's notable in the way the, 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 the spirit of this conference has imbued its uh, deliberations that the first thing I had to do when signing up for the conference was to sign a piece of paper that consigned everything I did and said into the public domain. Now, in common with the uh, click through agreements. Uh, I didn't read this, so I don't know what I, I committed myself to, be, to do, but I can't, uh, I don't, I'm not empowered to sign such agreements on behalf of the interna international organization that pays my salary. So I should say that uh, what I'm going to uh, contribute to the debate is more of a, a personal perspective, uh, and uh, I hope a con contribution to the debate that will attract your attention, nonetheless draw attention to uh, some of the model mongering that be, could contribute to the, uh, the WIPO process. Okay, uh, I'm already behind time. <laughs> the <laughs> Intergovernmental Committee... You still have 20 minutes to go. That, uh, <laughs> that's right. Now, I'll start my presentation now. Uh, <laughs> the, the WIPO Intergovernmental Committee uh, 
I won't go into, into the details of that. Uh, the details are simply too detailed. There's a rich vein of material there. And I'm, I'm delighted to see that uh, uh, scholars are starting to look at that um, with due um, uh, scepticism, but uh, look, look at that as a resource for work in this area, because there's a great deal of uh, empirical information there. And I would draw attention to this document in particular that will be hitting the streets, I hope, next week or the week after, which is a summary of uh, what's been done in the Intergovernmental Committee. There is a tendency to look for solid outcomes. Uh, that hasn't been achieved. There's a tendency to, uh, if you like, fetishise the concrete in this regard. But I think even from the first two speakers this morning, it's clear that uh, uh, concrete outcomes at the moment might be, might be premature, might even be counterproductive. But there's been a great deal that has uh, taken place. And uh, for perhaps if anyone would like to have a sort of a personally delivered copy, I'm happy to email this to them uh, if they want the details of the Intergovernmental Committee. So I won't, I won't go into that, the nitty gritty of it now. What I will touch on is uh, traditional knowledge and some of the, uh, the policy dilemmas and, and uh, questions posed by the um, initiatives for protection of traditional knowledge, especially through sui generis law. Uh, and in doing so, I'll just quickly touch on the, the sort of the broad framework that, that uh, is, is necessary here. Firstly, as Graham's mentioned, there are notions of increased defensive protection. That's to say, uh, well, it's not unlike standard defensive uh, tactics in IP management generally, uh, defensive publication, in effect, uh, drawing to the attention of examiners uh, the, the existence of material as prior art. Uh, but again, as Graham's already pointed out, this can in fact, in effect, be pyrrhic protection. It can actually lead to the very outcome that the indigenous or local communities don't want to achieve. That is to say, handing over traditional knowledge without uh, the due respect and the due protection that they expect of it. Which leads to uh, interest in positive protection, the assertion of specific positive rights, intellectual property rights or uh, analogous rights in the knowledge itself. And this can be done in a range of ways. Again, there's, there's a great deal of uh, uh, reported practical experience in this area. The looking though at devising sui generis forms of protection, here the principle uh, form follows function should apply. Uh, there, again, there's a tendency to look at precedents, look, look for models and, and cut and paste those, rather than looking at the, the function of protection, the sort of objective that protection is supposed to observe. Uh, and defining the function in turn begs the question of, well, what is the policy goal? What are we protecting for? What do we want to achieve through protection? And indeed, finally, touching on the, the theme of this conference, uh, that it raises deep questions about the nature of the public good in this context. If we can firstly make the assumption that by sui generis traditional knowledge protection, we mean something that will somehow remove material that was considered to be in the public domain, somehow restrict access to it, remove it to some extent from the public domain. And I make the point that uh, we do talk about the public domain, and I say here material that is considered to be in the public domain, for the communities concerned, this just raises the question of, well, considered by who? We didn't necessarily consider it to be in the public domain. You might have put it in the public domain, but that wasn't necessarily our idea. Uh, and prior informed consent comes in. Uh, this, this public domain concept of yours is, is actually somewhat alien to our epistemological world, to our spiritual, legal world. Uh, let's uh, talk about what you mean before you can uh, get our consent to put it in the public domain. Uh, now, traditional knowledge as a public good in itself. Well, yes, in, when it's in the public domain, it's a public good in terms of promoting cultural awareness, uh, cultural diversity, in, in informing uh, other creators and uh, enriching our lives generally. Uh, when it's technical traditional knowledge, medical knowledge, uh, of enormous potential benefit in, a, in more sort of utilitarian terms as well. But what about TK as a public good in that it is withheld 
from the public domain. The idea that uh, there, there are public good is being, is being promoted by the withdrawal or the withholding of traditional knowledge from the public domain. That's when it gets, uh, gets uh, interesting. It, that's when uh, policy choices become difficult. Uh, similarly, the preservation of traditional knowledge is a public good. This, this is the idea that uh, it should not be lost. It should not be diffused. Uh, it, should, it, it should not be uh, um, allowed to, to disappear. Uh, but what about protection? We have this tension or this lack of clarity between differing notions of protection and preservation. And in particular, what about IP, intellectual property style protection of traditional knowledge as a public good? Does that raise a whole set of other questions? And finally, uh, do we get the idea where preservation and protection start to merge? Where the, the, the very exclusivity of the traditional knowledge is integral to the community's self-conception, to their cultural identity. Think of sacred or secret knowledge, which loses its value when it's, when it's made public, may even lose its value when it's preserved in a sort of an archival sense. And with, with that, the, the, uh, a lot of, uh, an element of the identity of the community is lost. So that sort of idea of exclusivity of protection may be uh, part and parcel of cultural survival. Another question to consider is in, in addressing the public domain aspects of traditional knowledge. How big is the public you're talking about? Uh, maybe the owners or the stakeholders or the custodians, the beneficiaries of exclusively protected traditional knowledge are big enough to count as public. Now, how, how big is, is the public? Um, the, in the famous uh, turmeric case, the claim was made that uh, every Indian grandmother knew the traditional knowledge concern and to some extent was a custodian or, or, or had some sort of traditional relationship with that knowledge. Well, every Indian grandmother is a pretty big public. And, you know, even if, if rather difficult in this situation to concoct a kind of an exclusive right over that traditional knowledge, but if we are talking on you know, matters of that scale, then the exclusive beneficiaries of a, a so-called, you know, an IP right in traditional knowledge may be big enough themselves to be uh, public, um, benefiting from a public good. And there are uh, analogies in the intellectual property domain that are briefly noted there, where geographical indications, for example, an exclusive right, but one that may be in effect held or exercised on behalf of very sizable agricultural communities or uh, indeed uh, indigenous communities. Um, and a point that's been touched on, I think rightly in the, in the debate generally, is the idea of clarifying property rights, clarifying property rights as a, a public good in itself. Uh, and in this case, in, in the traditional knowledge case, and this is the, the final rather obscure point there is actually the, the pivot of what I'm going to conclude with very soon, the, the, uh, the idea of a public good in securing recognition of traditional knowledge norms beyond their traditional reach, getting, re getting legal recognition, legal effect of customary law governing traditional knowledge beyond the, the jurisdiction of, of the customary law, beyond the, beyond the national jurisdiction indeed, into foreign jurisdictions, the sort of uh, challenge that, that, uh, that uh, Graham outlined earlier. Um, Another point, very quickly, the, the, there is an uh, instrumental character of traditional knowledge in promoting pu uh, public good, and the CBD, Convention on Biological Diversity, is the exemplary uh, case of that, uh, where the famous Article 8J, uh, recognition of traditional knowledge, is in the context, not as an end in itself, but it's in the context of uh, in situ cons or promoting in situ conservation of biological diversity. So the protection of traditional knowledge does, like other intellectual property rights, contribute to a broader uh, social public good. Uh, and of course in the deba debate uh, there is this point, well so what? Uh, you know, so what about the public good? Isn't it the case that for broader reasons, you know, equity reasons, human rights reasons, uh, this redress of 
both past and justice reasons, shouldn't the interests of traditional knowledge, traditional knowledge holders trump uh, broader public goods? How do you how do you strike that balance? I mean, it's it's a uh, it's an issue on the table. Um, what, and the, the, one of the really challenging questions is, are we talking about intellectual property protection of traditional knowledge anyway? Uh, is it real intellectual property? Uh, personally, I believe it can be. That can be one of the solutions. Uh, but it does, it does raise questions about the question of, are we talking about the right public goods here? I mean, the, and the claim is sometimes times made misleadingly, I think, that it's not real intellectual property because it's not innovative. Uh, and in particular, it doesn't, there's no need to promote innovation in a traditional knowledge context because the innovation has, has already taken place. That's missing the point from several angles. Firstly, that traditional knowledge may indeed be innovative. But secondly, uh, it's not the only rationale for intellectual property protection. And we, we've had this you know, come up in, in many other contexts uh, this week. Uh, and here, actually, I just wanted to throw in the, the concept we, we were exploring uh, is there the basis for a new baseline for competition law for developing countries. Well, what about thinking about applying some of these, these um, standard doctrines to the traditional knowledge context, the, the, the concepts of unfair competition, unjust enrichment, slavish imitation, uh, in, the, in that interesting crossover between IP and uh, competition law. Um, and behind that, uh, in the search for sort of a, a doctrinal dressing for, for a, a, a traditional knowledge uh, IP right, there's a sense of, well, is it, is it something that is being developed as a natural extension, as an organic growth from uh, sort of canonical uh, IP doctrine? Or is it uh, a normative counter, a normative response, an antithesis? to the assertion of intellectual property rights on, on traditional knowledge subject matter. Anecdotally or narratively or historically, that seems to be what's happened. It's taken a patent, the assertion of a patent right to trigger the, the, the defensive interest, which in turn, because of the Pyrrhic protection problem, triggers the positive protection interest, which triggers in turn a claim for a specific IP right in traditional knowledge. Now, the point is, of course, you don't want to be captured by that historical narrative in, in setting, in, in adapting and applying the policy uh, 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 measures that you want to achieve. Um, and my um, and, and, and pivotal point, I think, here in the way through, the, the way of forging this bridge, if you like, is to suggest that customary law may be your normative baseline. That may be your starting point. Uh, for constructing even an international system concerning the protection of traditional knowledge. Uh, and I can prove that, but probably not much time in the next two minutes or whatever. Um, the crucial point is that the policy concern about traditional knowledge protection arises at the point of alienation of traditional knowledge from its traditional uh, legal context. That may be but consensually, raising the prior informed consent issue, or adversely, where it's simply misappropriated. Uh, but it's, the point is it's moved beyond the reach of traditional or customary law. The second scenario is where the, the whole customary context is starting to, to fade away, or is, is dissipating. And, the, and so the customary legal context that, that, um, that nurtured, that, that contained, the traditional knowledge that defined the traditional knowledge. In fact, that whole context is, is uh, ebbing away due to social changes. The need or concern arises in both of those contexts. So we, we might consider the protection, of the protection of traditional knowledge as traditional knowledge rather than you know, through, through secondary means. We, we might consider that as equivalent to the preservation of the, the normative context. Uh, the preservation here deliberately ambiguous. Preservation in the sense of um, not being allowed to, to, to dissipate, but also preservation in the sense of, of being 
applied, accompanying the knowledge as it leaves the community, accompanying the knowledge as it leaves the community and uh, as it's used in other contexts, in other countries, in other jurisdictions, that penumbra, that traditional uh, customary law penumbra, uh, follows it, accompanies it, to preserve it in that sense. Um, so, yeah, you have that in situ notion of bolstering customary law in situ and ex situ, uh, extending the reach, the effective reach of customary protocols. Uh, and there's an obvious analogy with the CBD here, where it is, it is protection not only of the knowledge, but the, the, the customs, practices, and the reference to the, uh, the lifestyle that, that embody this knowledge. Um, so, in analogy with the CBD, we might consider the conservation of cultural diversity as a public good, analogous to the conservation of biological diversity and the, the preservation of traditional knowledge as a uh, instrumental means to that end as well. Um, because there is this uh, final point here, this, this danger that um, preservation for its own sake can, can in itself destroy the, the customary legal framework. We had to destroy the customary law to save the traditional knowledge. That's not a good outcome, necessarily. Uh, I, this is actually where, where my presentation starts, the slides that you have. This is where I sort of key in there. And there's no possible way that I, I could um, go through this material. But what, I'm, what it really touches on is the uh, legal dilemmas that arise from the, uh, the, this traditional characteristic of traditional knowledge, the idea that it's rooted in the local, uh, uh, both in terms of jurisprudence but also in terms of uh, the way uh, laws are conceived and applied, are, are lived out in daily life and are embodied in daily practices. Uh, and yet there is international, uh, global interest in traditional knowledge for cultural reasons, for commercial reasons, for scientific reasons. Uh, how, to, how to deal with that, that tension? And I think that's an exactly analogous tension to the one that arises between the two perspectives of the early two speakers. Uh, it's the, the, the top-down, uh, the internationally driven, uh, as against the, the bottom-up, uh, customarily based. How, how, do you, how do you reconcile this gap? And I think you know, on both of these fronts, there is, there is a similar sort of uh, tension to deal with. Um, what I might do is move through to my conclusions. This is really just talking about uh, what, are, what is the conception of, of sui generis anyway. And uh, the, the, the main point I'd like to make is, that, is, is the point here that it's not the content as such, because traditional knowledge can, can, can cover really almost as wide a range of, uh, of subject matter as, as patent, patent law itself. Um, it, it depends on what it's about. You can't confine it according to specific content, unless you, may, unless you are talking about, uh, in an instrumental sense, protection for ecological reasons or medical reasons or whatever. But if you are really genuinely talking about sui generis traditional knowledge as such, you can't confine it according to subject matter. What you really have to look at is the traditional nature of, of the knowledge and the, the, the traditional context. You may even want to consider traditional forms of knowledge management because embodied in any intellectual property uh, system is a sense of, uh, well, is, is a, an implicit system for managing knowledge. And uh, it might be good to look at the, the form of knowledge management the desirable knowledge management from the point of view of the traditional knowledge stakeholders to see how that would be expressed in an intellectual property system rather than focusing on it as, as if it were the, the disclosure of a patent uh, specification. Okay, just then the, the, the question of what is a sui generis system. Is the system the the knowledge, the indigenous traditional knowledge system itself? Is it uh, a distinct legal mechanism that recognises or applies that indigenous or traditional knowledge system uh, as a secondary effect? Oh. 
uh, or is it the third point here, is it in fact a distinct set of rights that is somehow triggered by the indigenous uh, knowledge system? It, and it's an important choice to, to make. Uh, I won't make it now. Uh, but point out that there is, there is a tension between these, these objectives of the, the clarity, the, the precision, uh, the predictability, if you like, uh, of uh, a very clearly defined international system on the one hand and the goals of comprehensiveness, of inclusiveness, that holistic quality, that jurisprudential diversity that the Four Directions Council uh, stressed and universal adaptability, applicability to this immensely diverse uh, range of jurisprudential systems. Okay. Um, Your time's up. I'm I'll finish right now. It's going backwards, sorry. Here is the, here is the pitch then. Uh, you are all avid scholars of the PCT International Preliminary Examination Guidelines. Uh, the, this, this points out that in some contexts the invention may be based on the formulation of a problem to be solved uh, and in the hope that the solution be, may be obvious once the problem is clearly stated. I'd like therefore to try and clearly state the problem. The problem may not be the definition of traditional knowledge as such. Uh, as has been pointed out, traditional knowledge holders typically know full well what their traditional knowledge is and how they want to, how they feel it should be managed. Uh, that's part of their very cultural identity in, in many cases. So they don't, they don't need to be told uh, about that. The normative basis for protection already exists from their point of view. Uh, uh, as I point out, it is tradition that makes tradi uh, knowledge traditional knowledge. It is the tradition aspect that is important. And that introduces a subjective quality to the definition. So the problem may rather be how to create a vector for transmitting the customary law and values uh, to other jurisdictions through the operation of international law. Now, one example of this, it's not a model, it's not a precedent, but it is a rough analogue that might show how it could work in practice. And that is the geographical indication or the collective certification mark, all of the above at once. Because if you look at those systems, what they are, so of, uh, often a set of rules will be attached to, or be, be part of the registration, say, of a certification mark. Let's, let's consider those rules as a capsule of customary law, a nugget of that jurisprudential diversity that through the operation of the international system finds its way to other jurisdictions and is indirectly applied through the uh, operation of uh, trademark or geographical indication law. Um, and that could be done um, indirectly or, or quite, quite directly uh, through the rules being applied or simply by the fact that the, the material can only be produced in that ge geographical location where the customary law applies by definition. Okay, that's it. Uh, so we have that choice <laughs> between the community-based approach the grassroots approach and the international recognition, the, the, the point of Thomas Cotier that we need a harmonised international approach. What is the, the bridge? Well, it could be something like uh, an approach that, uh, where there's an articula a broad articulation of principles, uh, a sense of mutual recognition, national treatment, uh, but also a, a mechanism for safeguarding and recognising the customary law, which uh, I would suggest could be the uh, jurisdictional uh, baseline. Thank you very much. Um, apologies. Uh, thank you very much, Tony. I thought you were only joking when you said your 20 minutes would start when you said it was oh, finished. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Uh, the, <laughs> the next uh, uh, speaker is actually a commentator, uh, Rosemary Coombe. Um, Canada Research Chair in Law, Communication and Cultural Studies at York University uh, in Canada. Oh, thank you. Um, I think the uh, presentations here uh, have indicated to you uh, the complexity of the legal field, the bewildering uh, political problems posed 
uh, by this area and um, the brilliance of the lawyers who are going to solve these problems uh, for us um, by coordinating um, a number of um, unruly nation states at the World Intellectual Property Organization. Um, I can't do nearly that much in seven minutes, um, or, and I'm certainly not going to propose any new models. Uh, what I am going to do is just introduce to you to some more of the co complexity of the values at issue, and also put uh, these questions into a relationship with um, some of the larger themes that we've been addressing at this conference, and some uh, global context, um, some global normative context for considering it. Now, uh, tr traditional knowledge uh, isn't necessarily old all knowledge. It is um, often very new knowledge, but it's passed on in particular ways. Um, it is social knowledge. It can be very innovative. Uh, it is very dynamic. Um, but it's often tacit knowledge rather than codified knowledge. Um, or, and when it's codified, it may be codified in forms that may be culturally specific and therefore difficult to assess or have access to. And um, certainly there are a lot of people in the world who'd like to keep it that way. But I think its value may require new forms of intellectual and political recognition. Now, Carlos Correa, for example, in his study of traditional medicine shows that um, there are a number of methods of diagnosis and treatment that may not easily translate without understanding something of the social and spiritual context. And he actually refers to this as people's health culture to emphasize the fact that it is cultural. Um, some, kind, some forms of traditional knowledge only work when um, they are ritually um, administered. Now, we could just say, oh, well, all that soft, mushy, religious stuff, we're not interested in that. Um, that has nothing to do with intellectual property, um, which is, is perfectly fair. Uh, we could also decide that we're going to expand trade secrets to recognize forms of value which are not commercial, because, in fact, these people manage and keep this knowledge uh, secret and confidential uh, in, in very um, clear ways that they can demonstrate to you. And if this knowledge has value, the fact that that value is not immediately commercially obvious doesn't mean that it's not value for the purposes of um, health care, for the purposes of food security, for instance. We might also um, promote more respect for sh the sharing of these methods. And in fact, I think someone said, the other, said something about collective action. In fact, Aboriginal peoples are engaged in forms of collective action that are very sophisticated. You're, there are networks of healers in Chiapas meeting regularly with networks of healers in northern Quebec. There is large Aboriginal networks of sharing of Indigenous knowledge to share, help each other and, their, and help between communities. So also, I think we've got to understand that in most societies, religion encodes information and institutions, knowledge that's basic to lo the local economy and the local ecology. And that traditional knowledge will involve a lot of beliefs that to an outsider appear superstitious or primitive. Um, anthropological work suggests that you know, Zapotec science, uh, which has enormous uh, value, is heavily informed by spiritual beliefs but nonetheless encodes insights which are accurate, sophisticated, and pragmatic. Now, the Athabascans and Australian Aboriginals hold TK, which enables their hunting and gathering in marginalized environments. They know that ecology very well, and that's why they're called upon. In fact, it's obligatory um, in, in certain states and provinces within those jurisdictions to engage them when you're doing an environmental impact study, because they understand the environment in different ways um, that are a much more fine-grained and specific. Um, now, we could just say, okay, well, let's just divorce the science from the religion here um, and just tear away this sort of cosmological gloss from <coughs> uh, a practical core and just attach uh, our protections to the core. Um, but in fact, most of these forms of knowledge are systemic. Um, now. Here's another example. Um, just try to get at what I'm talking about here. 
In um, Mexico, again, part of one of these ICBG projects, such as Graham mentioned, um, traditional people were kept handing over plants that they said had um, particular qualities, biochemical qualities. And the university researchers were quite frustrated because they kept getting the same plants. They said, no, 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 we've already assayed those plants. We already know what the biochemical properties of those plants are. Well, these plants came from different communities uh, where they've been cultivated by different peoples. And those people said, no, those are not the same plants. Now, according to a Western categorical um, botanical scheme, they were exactly the same plants. Well, they managed to smuggle some of them into the assay labs, and lo and behold, they had different biochemical properties. Now, well, that's a way of saying that indigenous categorical systems are different, and those differences reveal differences that Western science obscures. So when we lose languages, we are losing tools, points of entry into other forms of difference. And the no singular language or terminology can encompass the world's biological diversity. And um, in fact, it's the world's cultural diversity that keeps the world's biological diversity um, ongoing. OK. Um, but I think also, holist these holistic forms of human ecology are known by people. Um, and instead of, I think, um, keeping our emphasis on focusing on ways of protecting traditional knowledge, we should also um, at the same time remember that we should be respecting their lives and recognizing their expertise uh, and protecting their livelihoods. Now, I was going to do the rest of this quickly with uh, a couple of uh, quotes from uh, people here. Um, other regarding preferences can only be taken up by unlikely unpredictable alliances. Um, these are very unpredictable alliances. Um, and I think I would add to that amongst unknown actors. Um, I think it's really, really important that we don't see the social field as fixed. Indigenous peoples are emerging all the time. There are no, um, you know, there's no limited finite group of people in the world who are indigenous. The in concept of, in of the indigenous is evolving and changing, and more people are emerging as indigenous all the time. Um, and in fact, um, one fears sometimes that the mantle of, of culture is, is being used to uh, depoliticize poverty uh, at, at some moments, because there's so much more leverage in being considered indigenous internationally. Um, local communities don't just exist. They, call them, they are called into being by laws like this that um, seek them out. Um, and so as we saw in the, in the um, Peruvian case, those people willing to deal were considered <laughs> the local community. Um, but there's also a big anthropological literature that says how you get to get, be recognized as a community has a lot to do with how you're situated with respect to international NGOs and what your relationship is with the state. So none of these um, sort of identity categories are naturalized. They are contingent, they are emergent, they're constructed, they're contested. Uh, another quote, solutions have to be tied to global norms. I've spent a quite a bit of time trying to suggest that traditional knowledge can only be understood, um, and that the appropriate framework here is the international human rights framework. Uh, the WTO, after all, is subject to international human rights, and so is the interpretation of TRIPS. Uh, the, the nice thing is that human rights sets maximum levels of protection uh, in, for intellectual property generally, um, provides a sort of set of arguments for limiting intellectual properties that um, appropriate uh, traditional knowledge. They also provide a um, series of mechanisms and, and uh, responsibilities of states to monitor multinational actors, although that very rarely happens. Um, uh, another quote, academics are good at taking the long view and seeing how things may knock up against each other. Uh, I think concerns with maintaining cultural diversity, in fact, are not marginal uh, or limited to minorities. That uh, we are seeing a revitalization of international cultural rights by unlikely coalitions. Now here I want to echo that I don't think intellectual property rights are sufficient nor exclusive unless they're tied to public policy strategies, as uh, Professor Koche said. There are now 53 nation states at work on an international instrument on cultural diversity, an international legally binding instrument on cultural <coughs> diversity that will allow them to, to posit an, an affirmative right 
to promote cultural diversity um, against um, trade obligations. Okay. Um, this, is, so this is both not just a network of nation states, but also a, a civil society network of creators, artists, and uh, local creative industries. What can I possibly say um, in one minute or less? <laughs> that cultural diversity is recognized primarily because the desire to promote and maintain a culturally pluralistic public sphere with a wide diversity of forms of cultural expression is recognized as a public good. Um, that if we're going to be concerned with protecting the cultural commons, we need to think about what's going to be there and what contact, content will this commons have. So um, to echo Ruth Okiji, in addition to sustainable access, we need models for sustainable production of culturally diverse content and different forms of creativity are nurtured by different cultural traditions. And thus, I hope that these initiatives at the CBD and at the World Intellectual Property Organization um, are linked in some way to these, to these UNESCO declarations um, and the ongoing work to um, see uh, and understand ourselves as in dialogue with people from other cultural uh, traditions and that the maintenance of those diversity of cultural traditions um, is, is essential to this uh, revitalized understanding of public goods. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much uh, indeed, Rosemary. Uh, David, um, over to you. Mr. Chair, if I may, if I may have your indulgence, I'd like to just consult with my colleague Jerry Reichman and ask whether Given the length of the panel, it might be as well for me not to present. I have, uh, the remarks have been written, and I'm happy to distribute them uh, later in the morning if, if that seems wise to you. As always, we're about 15 minutes late, but we'll, we will make it up to the team. All right. Go ahead and observe your time. <laughs> <laughs> That really won't be a problem. I actually learned to write professionally in radio and television where the time you're given really means something. And <laughs> while, <laughs> while it is true that the quality of what you write often suffers, at least in radio and television, that doesn't really matter. And perhaps, uh, <clears throat> perhaps on this occasion, <clears throat> it will not matter uh, either. Uh, now. <clears throat> I can get this up. I want to talk this morning in the uh, few minutes uh, that I have to me, uh, assigned to me, about folklore. I'd like to talk about it a bit more closely. I'd like to make an argument to the effect that <clears throat> the case, at least for folklore and protection, is really a case for benign neglect. Let me, let me suggest what it is I mean. I happened a week ago to meet with my Adopted brother, Do Kak Chin, who is the deputy director of the Copyright Office of the Democratic People's Republic of Vietnam. And because I met with Chin and talked with him uh, at length, I suppose it was natural that Vietnam should be on my mind and that it should in some sense play a central part in my remarks this morning. At the very northeast corner of, ha of Vietnam, hard by the China Sea, some 60 statute miles, Above Haiphong and Hanoi, just below the border where the Chinese mainland begins, lies a secluded bay, its waters clear and deep and emerald in color, a place of magic and surreal beauty called Halong. The Vietnamese say this is their birthplace, the birthplace of their country and their people. Their folklore abounds with stories about Halong Bay, among them <clears throat> this story, which I shall share with you this morning, a story that I think beautiful. In the dawn of time, when magic creatures lived upon the earth and some men were free and others not, a great dragon came down from the north, bearing a people and their destiny in its mouth, a people rescued by the dragon from enslavement, whom it now sheltered safely among its many sharp and fearsome teeth. But the day was hot and the dragon was exhausted after its long journey. When at last it came to the place called Halong, it could go no further. Slowly as the sun was setting, the dragon allowed itself to sink 
into the brilliant green waters of the bay, so cool, so inviting, until at last nothing could be seen except the sharp scales along its back, <coughs> which jutted above the waters as if they were thousands of islets made of karst, extruded limestone, rather than, as in fact the case was, evidence of the miracle of creation that marked this bay as a sacred place. And there the dragon slumbered, slumbers still from that day until this very morning. In time, the people the dragon had rescued made their way to the surface of the waters, and then on south into a land of green and fragrant beauty where they lived, sometimes enslaved again and sometimes free, and so it has been from that time until ours. But one day, the people know, the dragon will awaken and rouse itself from the seabed in which it has been lying, and then the fortunes of its people, the Vietnamese, will be full and rich, and they will live in harmony and freedom forever. I've been thinking of producing a feature film, an animated film, based on this story, but with the addition of some modest TNA and perhaps a score by Moby. <coughs> In short, a cheesy and derivative movie aimed at the cretinous sub-teen audience and their no less cretinous parents to whom I propose to market the vehicle <laughs> through the now standard advice of securing a PG rating for a soft R film. <coughs> But what of the Vietnamese and their niggling objections to the profanation of their sacred mythology, should they happen to have any? If I understand the regimes envisioned by the proponents of most new rights for traditional knowledge and folklore, then so long as I am prepared to speak in suitably circuitous and solemn platitudes, and perhaps throw a point or two on the backside of the deal, aimed more or less in the general direction of Hanoi or someone there, then I'm golden. <coughs> But what if Hanoi and Vietnam doesn't go along with the program? What exactly do we do with a country that has its own ideas about IP regimes? In the case of Vietnam, I think I need not remind you, uh, invasion is not in the picture. If I were not a producer, I would take the question that I posed very seriously. What if I were Vietnamese? Suppose I said I do not want the global community's assistance. What if I imagine I am capable of assisting myself? Suppose I think it insulting to propose solutions on my behalf. What if I conclude that the proposals are not in my interest? Suppose I find them, you should pardon the expression, foreign. Now, as it happens, in fact, I have some idea of what the Vietnamese think about these matters. More precisely, I have some idea of what they think publicly and what they think privately but I shall leave it to the Vietnamese to speak for themselves about that should they choose to do so, for it is just here that my own thinking necessarily intervenes. I say necessarily, for I have four rules when it comes to traditional knowledge and folklore, and the first of them is this, speak for yourself. It is wildly inappropriate, in my view, to presume to speak for others. This includes the Vietnamese, who are, as I have indicated, capable of speaking for themselves, they will let us know if they need our help. That isn't likely. Second, do not presume to define others as we must do if we speak of indigenous peoples. This is nothing more, I think, than warmed over Rousseau. Once again, we are engaged in a remake of Lowe, the noble savage. <clears throat> it will be unnecessary to know who others are, much less try to define them if you do not propose to speak for them. And in my view, that is all to the good. Third. Do not confuse an impulse to do good with an unconscious wish to do well. As James Missioner observed many years ago, the Congregationalist missionaries made this mistake when they came to Hawaii in the 1800s. Now look at that place. No more missionaries, no more Hawaiians, nothing but tourists and pineapples all the way down. <laughs> Fourth, as Frederick Law Olmsted advised in other circumstances, make no little plans. Make no big plans either. In fact, make no plans at all. <laughs> what we want here is a failure to communicate. No smarmy platitudes, no slippery analysis, no patronizing intrusion into the sacred precincts of others, nothing but a finger at our lips. No. Let the Vietnamese be Vietnamese without our leave or say so. Let us respect borders where there are borders, and let us recognize them equivalently where they do not in fact or in law exist. 
Respect for the autonomy of others does not oblige us to define them nor to establish them in law, but rather merely to stay our hand until they present themselves in whatever fashion they may please. Ah, but I hear you grumbling. What will economists and lawyers and academics do if we are not to meddle? What of the alphabet agencies, the NGOs, what of the MPAA and the RIAA and Pharma, who stand waiting in the wings with others like them, ready to lend their helpful assistance in distributing equity horizontally or whatever. Above all, what about revenues? As Senator Everett Dirksen, one of my favorite senators, once observed, a billion here, a billion there, pretty soon you're talking about real money. Are we just, are we just to leave it lying on the table? Well, not exactly. I propose a kind of horizontal equity of my own. Let us allow Vietnam to deal with the question of folklore on its own behalf. Let us remain free to do the same on ours. I can make my movies if I am crass enough to do so, and I am, without a license from Hanoi, and Hanoi can refuse to protect it under the IP regimes it is otherwise obliged to establish and enforce, and it can exclude them from ex exhibition if it wants. These are surely modest rights. Their reservation will not greatly impede the advance of our larger global commerce, nor do they require ingenuity in their devising. The truth is, until bilateral treaties began to intervene, treaties pressed upon the Vietnamese as a condition of membership in the WTO, this was the state of law in Vietnam, and for that matter in China and elsewhere. Indeed, I recognize the essential lack of originality in what I am endorsing here, and I revel in it. It is, as my friend and sometime colleague and one-time student Shaquille Bati, now of the WIPO Office of Traditional Knowledge and Folklore, assures me the position, more or less, of those indigenous peoples who have opposed these initiatives for a very long while. I acknowledge the antecedents to my position here. I accept them altogether cheerfully, for this is the very outcome I would want, the very point I mean to make. Who am I to improve upon the wishes in the matter of those who are most affected? No less so, who are we, the late, and I have no doubt now sainted, Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan once proposed the practice of benign neglect in a rather distant setting. Whether he was right on that occasion, I need not consider here, nor do I mean to endorse. It is enough to appropriate his thought. The case for benign neglect in the matter of traditional knowledge and folklore is simple and straightforward. Its essential power lies along the axis of respect for the autonomy of others that we profess in settings of this sort. It is right and it is just to stay our hands when traditional knowledge and folklore are at issue. Against this course of action, all others seem to me naive, ill-considered, disingenuous, or worse. There is no middle ground, in my opinion. We cannot act to save the interests we value without intrusion. We cannot intrude without destroying the very essence of the things that make them valuable. We would be well advised to act by not acting. We should let sleeping dragons lie. Thank you. <laughs> So thank you very much for that. Wow. I guess I should say I have nothing to say, really. I should rest my case there. But I think David Lang has made a very important uh, point, and I think even anticipates somewhat uh, my, uh, my approach. Uh, it's clear from all the previous uh, presentations that the issues are more or less um, identified and we're all fairly at uh, idem on most of them. And I thought that the real challenge for us, especially um, in the Africa Bureau, uh, where I work in the World Intellectual Property Organization, uh, is really to avoid the situation that arose with the uh, Uruguay round uh, negotiations uh, under GATT leading to WTO, where the African countries and, of course, a lot of other developing countries were clearly you know, ill-prepared and uh, not fully um, conversant with the issues. And, uh, and, of course, we can see the results now. So our position has really been that we should, at the outset, ensure that the traditional communities are fully engaged in the process 
that they understand fully all the issues and again in a sense uh, agreeing with what uh, David Lang um, has said are really the ones who should define their interests, identify their interests and come up with solutions if they feel that solutions uh, are required. Um, Professor uh, Cotier uh, said, and I think, again, this is a fundamental uh, uh, issue, that it is a question of linking the traditional system with the world of commercial operations. And, and the challenge is really how uh, uh, we do that. Um, I think also that Graham um, makes uh, an important point that uh, the nature of traditional knowledge, what is it? It means different things to uh, different people and even to indigenous peoples themselves. So I thought that what I would uh, talk about is essentially the steps that we have taken uh, in Africa uh, in this regard and uh, to sensitize the traditional communities there, uh, find out precisely what they think uh, about these issues, and try to get them uh, to speak, as it were, uh, uh, for themselves. And in this context, last year we organized uh, three meetings. We tried to get all the stakeholders uh, together, um, as well as you know, government, NGOs, everybody, uh, and try to fashion out a, an African position uh, in the IGC. Uh, we had a number of meetings, uh, well, the two meetings first, and uh, in those two meetings, almost all the countries in sub-Saharan Africa uh, took part, and then had an experts group meeting uh, at the very end uh, to try to really harmonize uh, positions and identify uh, issues. And I thought it might be interesting just to see what they came out with, and, and I mean they really, not uh, uh, WIPO sort of putting its, uh, uh, itself uh, in, in their place. Um, as regards uh, access to genetic resources uh, and benefit sharing, um, this is their, their, their statement. Uh, in view of the alarming rate of loss and misappropriation of genetic resources, States are urged to put in place legislative, administrative, and strategic policy measures and mechanisms for the, cons uh, for the conservation and sustainable use of biological diversity while protecting the rights of the owners and users of genetic resources. And such measures and mechanisms should include a, the preparation of national laws on the protection of the rights of local communities in respect of their genetic resources, the development of national policies and laws on the protection, conservation, preservation, and sustainable use of genetic resources, the creation of a competent national authority responsible for the regulation, monitoring, and coordination of developmental activities, including access to and the, and the fair and equitable uh, sharing of benefits in respect of genetic resources and all other matters relating to traditional knowledge. Um, they go on to say that the, um, that the group supports the, um, the proposals of the IGC for the guide on um, contractual practices. And, um, and here they say that contractual arrangements on access to genetic resources should take into account the following points and principles. Any access to genetic resources for industrial, commercial, or research purposes should be the subject of a prior request in writing addressed to the competent national authority or any other relevant body responsible for genetic resources in accordance with national laws. Adoption of the principle of prior informed consent in the process of access and the fair and equitable sharing of benefits. The subject matter of each contract, the rights and obligations of all parties, the nature of the benefits and the method of their distribution and the identity of the beneficiaries must be clearly specified. The protection of the supplier's interests subject to assurance of the preservation and permanency of the genetic resource for present and future generations. And um, they also supported putting into place national and uh, international regulatory mechanisms and frameworks for monitoring the compliance by the parties of the terms and conditions of contracts relating to access to genetic resources and the fair and equitable sharing of benefits. 
Um, in respect to the protection of uh, bio biotechnology and biological resources, they felt that there should be in accordance with the precautionary principle endeavors for the respect for the rights of biotechnology inventors and innovators with due regard to the rights of the owners of genetic resources. They also felt that there should be uh, the protection of all inventions and innovations with due regard to the rules of bioethics, the establishment of national biosafety regulatory frameworks, and assistance to researchers and innovators in the protection of their inventions. Um, they dealt with these issues um, under three headings, as uh, the IGC uh, also does. So under the heading of traditional knowledge, they believe that in considering existing and new sui generis forms of, uh, of protection for TK, attention should be paid to determining and identifying the subject matter of protection, the type of protection desired, the content of the rights to be granted, the duration of the rights granted, and the identity of the owners of the rights. And in this respect, they said that in developing effective national, regional, and international systems of protection, that it is necessary to develop flexible sui generis systems that take customary laws, protocols, and practices into account to provide protection not adequately provided by existing rights and systems. And um, they also believe that uh, it was necessary for strategies for identifying the subject matter to be protected could inter alia include compiling inventories of traditional knowledge and the natural heritage with the assistance of uh, ethics committees. Uh, the better organization of the sector com com uh, comprising traditional knowledge. Uh, cooperation between traditional medicine and modern medicine suppliers and the teaching of traditional knowledge at primary, secondary, and uh, uh, tertiary uh, levels and felt that national authorities should be continuously and fully involved in all phases of the development and implementation of uh, these activities. Um, they point out, I think as also, has also been mentioned, that the owners of traditional knowledge are at the outset, the individuals, families, and or local communities with which the knowledge, uh, from which the knowledge has come. And if these cannot be identified, then the state <coughs> should stand in uh, uh, for them. Uh, they're also in favor of developing a legally binding international instrument recognizing pr and protecting and rewarding traditional knowledge uh, and uh, uh, innovations and support the working definition of uh, traditional knowledge and the compilation of uh, an inventory of periodicals related to TK for inclusion in the minimum documentation list of the PCT. So to also have uh, a TK uh, a, a data there. Um, as far as uh, 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 folklore is concerned, they believe that uh, existing intellectual property rights such as copyright, trademarks, including certification and collective marks, and industrial designs may provide adequate protection for expressions of folklore in respect of tradition-based creations where the creator or creators of the expression is or are uh, 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 ident uh, identifiable. And um, as regards the uh, IGC, um, they feel that the IGC should examine the means by which intellectual property registration systems, particularly the trademark and industrial design system, could be adapted to enhance the protection provided to expressions of, uh, of folklore. And they also support a study of the relationship between customary laws, protocols, and practices governing custodianship use and tr transmission of expressions of folklore on the one hand and the formal intellectual property system on the other uh, in relation inter, uh, inter alia to the establishment of uh, sui generis systems of protection and also so as to ensure that intellectual property rights uh, do not preclude continued customary creation and use of uh, expressions of folklore. Of course there's the WIPO UNESCO model provisions that uh, they uh, supported and feel uh, should be actually uh, built upon and act as a basis for uh, uh, an international uh, uh, instrument. And um, they clearly also favor uh, in this context the establishment of a comprehensive international binding instrument uh, on the protection of expressions of folklore uh, with some form of dispute settlement mechanism, either similar to that which is obtainable uh, under the TRIPS agreement or 
under the WIPO uh, Arbitration and Mediation uh, uh, Center. And um, finally, they, they're also supportive of the continued cooperation at the uh, international level uh, between WIPO, uh, um, the uh, CBD, the FAO, UNESCO, uh, uh, WTO. And uh, they remain convinced of the need for the establishment of a, a WIPO standing committee on uh, intellectual property and genetic resources, TK and folklore, in order that these important issues should be taken into account within a framework designed to achieve specific results uh, in line with other substantive uh, uh, issues being dealt with uh, at WIPO. So I think that the real uh, challenge, I mean, for us, we're, 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 very, uh, we're very happy with how that process has been uh, evolving. And uh, a number of um, important and uh, 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 good experts are being developed in the region who are making an important uh, uh, input uh, into this uh, whole debate. And for us, we feel that this really is uh, the challenge, I think, also for the academic community as well as for uh, international organizations, that we do have to uh, uh, move from the, uh, the, the, the theory and the ideas um, to putting something in place concretely. And to be able to do that, um, we, we have to involve in a, a meaningful way uh, the people that we feel that uh, this whole system is designed to, um, to benefit. And so if it's a question, as was mentioned earlier, of um, inequities being uh, redressed, uh, it is important that we allow uh, uh, them to speak. And uh, this is the direction, certainly, in which we are going uh, in WIPO. Uh, so thank you very much indeed for your attention.